So today I'm going to try to calculate the exposure settings that I need for traditional magnesium flash photography for use with 100 ISO sheet film. Now I'm going to try some test pictures to try to gauge the lens settings that I need to get a proper exposure. And I'm going to be measuring the distances precisely so hopefully these settings can be replicated. Now this is just an approximation of the light output of 2 grams of flash powder at a specific distance from the subject. Even then, my best hope for getting an exposure will be bracketing, which is taking three or more photos at different exposures. So we need to find out the total light output of two grams of flash powder. Although the duration and the brightness will be fluctuating, I'm hoping that the total light output will be approximately the same. Now a flash lamp is essentially just a light source, and it's a hard light source, meaning that it creates sharp shadows. It can be backed with a whiteboard to create soft light, or multiple flashes could be set off at the same time to create two or three point lighting. Historically, it was used indoors where there wasn't enough light available for photography. It can be used as your only light source if your ambient light is so low that it won't register during the exposure or as an additional lighting source to boost ambient lighting. Basically, it can be used any way that you can use a light. My interest in this lighting is mainly for historical demonstration purposes. So for me, the most important part is that there's a brilliant flash, lots of sparks, and a huge lingering cloud of smoke. Although being that I'm using magnesium flash, I might as well create a portfolio of flash lamp images.
One thing that is hard about magnesium flash lamps is learning how to get the filament to burn out so that the powder ignites. If the filament isn't absolutely perfect when you squeeze the hand grip, nothing happens. So the first thing I had to do was sit down and start testing filaments and figure out why some filaments worked and others didn't. A working filament is basically a failing circuit. Too much current goes over a wire that is not thick enough to support it and the wire shorts out. In other words, it burns up. So this is exactly what I need to create is a circuit that fails under 3.7 volts, which is a very low voltage. So to achieve this, I have to clean the post with the razor blade to get the previous filament fragments out of the post grooves. Make sure that the ends of the filaments are thick enough that they fit tightly in the post grooves, which ensures that I have a good electrical connection. So to do this, I twist both ends of the filament similar to a handlebar mustache. And the center of the filament needs to be spread out loosely and it can't have too many steel fibers. Too many fibers would mean that I created a good circuit and a good circuit is not going to fail. So this has to be a very small amount of steel wool. Also, the center of the filament needs to be pushed down in a U shape. And I have to make sure that some of the lower fibers of the filament are covered in the powder while some of the upper ones are not. If the filament doesn't touch the powder, it will burn but not ignite the powder. And if all of the filament fibers are covered in powder, it won't burn because the filament does require oxygen in order to burn. Something that is really handy about the flash shooter flash lamp is that the red indicator light shows me the power drain on the battery and thus can be used for analyzing the filament. If the red LED is bright, no power is passing through the filament, so I need to check the post connections. If the red LED is dark, the power is passing freely through the filament, so I need to thin out the filament fibers. Now if the LED is dim, the power is struggling to get through the filament and that's going to create the failing circuit that we need. And just like that, you should see a flash. So if the filament burns and there was no flash, the filament wasn't touching the flash powder. And if the filament doesn't burn, it may be that the filament is buried in the flash powder. And I've got to remind myself that anytime I'm working with flash powder, when I go up to the flash lamp, I need to put on the safety glasses because the posts are hot and that flash powder could go off at any time. The best aperture settings I found for ISO 100 sheet film with two grams of flash powder and the flash lamp five foot from the subject is either F8 or F11. I think F11 came out a little better, but to be sure I would bracket at both F8 and F11. Now, I was really surprised about the quality of light of the flash lamp. I really thought it would look like I was standing in the dark with a flashlight in my face because of the small camera mounted flash bulbs that we're used to seeing on digital and 35 millimeter cameras, which create hard light and that red eye effect that we're used to seeing, not to mention that the light is shot straight into your face from the camera, which creates a really unnatural lighting because in nature the sun is either above us or it's rising or setting but it's never coming straight out of our face, which is what these 
camera flashes are simulating. So flash lamps have two things that are going for them that create great lighting. One, it's not mounted to the camera, but it's up and to the side like studio lighting. And two is that it has a mirror reflector behind it, which helps soften the light. So in the Victorian era, they actually had better flash lighting than our cheap modern cameras. Also, I was expecting the highlights to be blown out like a really overexposed photo. But as I found out, an overexposed flash setting is just the result of the wrong aperture setting. So as you examine this photo, you can see that this is a great exposure with good lighting and great mid-tone detail. So I was looking at a close-up of the eyes from one of my exposures and I noticed that there was a really strange look about it. There's actually a lot of information in this picture that are hidden in the eyes. For one, that little twinkle of light in the eyes is actually the flash lamp going off during the exposure. Second, there's something unnatural going on here that's really fascinating. The face is lit up with light, yet the eyes are dilated. Basically because the flash was so quick, that the eyes didn't have time to constrict. So next time you're looking at old historical photographs, try to think about the light source that's illuminating the subject. You might even find an old image that was taken with a flash lamp. Now, one thing I always find myself doing is looking deep into the eyes in the old photographs because I'm always wondering if I'm going to see a reflection of the photographer in his studio. One other thing I notice is when the flash goes off is that people tend to close their eyes or pull back. So that can be a problem such as in this picture where I closed my eyes during part of the exposure. And in this image where I moved back when the flash went off, creating movement in the photo. Also with this type of flash setup, the flash doesn't go off immediately. First I have to hold down the trigger for a second, then I see a faint orange glow, then the flash goes off spontaneously. So it takes a while to get used to this type of photography. My conclusion about flash powder is that it's a very usable medium that creates beautiful lighting. It has good latitude for exposure settings, and a correct exposure is very easy to achieve. 